All right. Looking good. Okay, I see the, the meeting's being report, recorded. Thank you, Chris. Chris Mayers, our, our uh, sergeant at arms. Got it. Um, I see your son's back there, Cameron. Is Cameron back? Is that Cameron? That's him in the flesh. Hey, Cam. All right. So nice to see you. Okay, very fine. We'll be bringing you guys online uh, a little bit later uh, to start off the, uh, the club meeting. Uh, we always start off with robot news. Who's got robot news out there? I'm sorry. Well, I'll, mention, I'll mention really quickly that um, Dan Albert and I have uh, been hosting a Jetson meetup uh, monthly at his place in Milpitas, Fremont area. Uh, so anybody who's interested in learning Jetson technologies uh, to join in on the fun, it's posted on the news group. And the next meeting is actually going to be next Tuesday. The, is Tuesday the 31st or the 29th? Uh, Tuesday, that's the 31st. Yeah, Tuesday the 31st is, is the next one. Yeah. And that's uh, the uh, um, NVIDIA, Nano, I believe. All things NVIDIA Jetson, correct. There's probably a lot of talk about Docker and containers and stuff like that, I suspect. We're doing a lot of different things. Um, next, our, this meeting, we're going to be upgrading our uh, SDK to 4.6, the NVIDIA, and we're going to be playing around with PyTorch. So if you're interested in learning PyTorch, come join us. All right, we're on robot news here. Any more robot news out there? I think the obvious uh, robot news uh, of the week was the uh, the Tesla robot. And there were a lot of comments on that in the uh, mailing list. <clears throat> By the way, everybody's on mailing list, right? I'm gonna post the mailing list in the chat. Um, uh, I wonder if Wayne Wayne had some interesting thoughts on the Tesla robot in that it was a joke. Oh, I don't see Wayne anymore. Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't, couldn't un unclick my mute. Um, uh, folks, what he's proposing is so far beyond what is possible right now. It's hard for me to take it seriously. Okay, the, the best arm out there we have is the, the Da Vinci arm uh, by uh, Intuitive Surgical, and that's still way less than what he's proposing doing. So really, um, you know, he, he, he likes to speak big. I'm a huge fan of him, but I, I doubt very much that he's been able to leapfrog, uh, you know, the, the literally billions of dollars that have gone into arms research over the decades. That's just my opinion. So a question, Wayne. Mm-hmm. Do you think he is as far beyond the state of the art in robots as he was when he announced that he was going to make a, a spaceship booster that could fly back and land vertically on Earth? Or, uh, or um, when he said he was going to make an electric car that was better than any other electric car that had ever been made? I, I have no, no complaints about his statements about the electric car when he started the space stuff. That was about 20 years ago. And he learned a lot. Okay. He didn't know much at the beginning. He knows a lot now. So I'll, I'll give him credit. But to sit there and say that, you know, announcing it versus actually having it, that's a different story entirely. It's all, it's all I, I, about the show. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is, this is I, just, I just want to add, I want to add one thing uh, is that um, the information he's gathering out on the streets and the way he's doing it. Uh, with his with his neural network uh, is a, is applicable, but I, I hear you, uh, Wayne. It's uh, it's all about the show. Go ahead. Oh hi, yeah, this is Dillo. Um, I just kind of wanted to sort of echo some of the others here. That uh, I mean, there are a lot of people. I think the way the reason he gets away with it is because he has, on a number of occasions, actually delivered, as opposed to others who have simply you know, blown off a lot of hot air and been showmen and really uh, attracted a lot of attention, but then were not able to deliver. And, you know, 10, 20 years ago, everybody thought, well, the electric car will never happen because Detroit will never let it happen. And they they can't do it because, you know, da, 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 da. and he went off and did it. 
And then there was the whole thing about like, you know, we tried for decades to do space, you know, reusable launch vehicles, uh, cheap space access, like the best that the shuttle was able to do was like $15,000 a pound. So I think he's, you know, he has, he's done some things and he's actually delivered and that lets him basically burn a lot of, you know, credibility. He, he's, he's got like credibility to burn. Um, All right. And so I think that's what get what what lets him get away with this is just show up All with right. a guy in a spandex suit. Let's let's move this along. We got a lot of stuff coming up. What about the uh, Intel Real Sense? Any comments out there? Yeah, that was that was the other one. <laughs> uh, disappointed, but not surprised. I've seen this in other big technology companies where they make bold plans and bold moves and try to establish a toehold in a market. And then somebody back at headquarters looks at everything and realizes that the actual revenue, like how it actually impacted the whole business, is maybe a couple percent at most. And they just decide to kill it because um, it's just really, for all the time and effort they're putting into it, it's just not making the company any money. Regardless of what kind of a toehold they actually have regardless of how much it's actually being used. And so I was kind of like, you know, disappointed, but not surprised. My I'll add to that, Dillo. I think, I think I started this by posting that an initial press release. Since that's come out, there's been some more updates from Intel, kind of claiming that that initial press release was premature and they're not killing the entire real sense line. Um, it's even on there if you go to the real sense sdk website they even have now added a paragraph there saying what they're doing it sounds like certain cam devices the um the lidars and the tracking camera and a couple are definitely going away but the basic the 400 series depth cameras and stereo cameras they're still supporting they're claiming for you no know, only maybe three year commitment that they, they're putting a life cycle commitment on the newer one, the 455. I think the things like the 415 that are already two or three years old, they're not really giving you a guarantee. Ralph, can you, can you find that. Ralph, can you find that link and post it in the chat? Sure. Okay. What else out there? Robot news, anything? I was going to say the, um, I don't know if anybody's discussed the Xiaomi cyber dog, you know, that uh, it was, that happened on the 11th. So that uh, just wondering if anybody uh, signed up or if, if anybody in America is, was allowed to pay, uh, you know, sign up to buy that. Like that's like a $1,600 spot or something. Yeah. It's cheap. I mean, relative. $3,500. No, it said $3, it was like. Dollar chart, chart. Okay. It was two. It was like uh, fifteen hundred dollars, as they say, to the first one thousand people uh, for like a um, hobbyists and fans of Xiaomi. But I don't know if it was. There was no link anywhere, and that it's, the thousands probably gone by you know right away. But I don't know if it was even allowed in the U.S. It said something about Chinese. But yeah, then you can eventually buy it for how much? I, I don't know that it wasn't a complete scam in the first, second, and third place. <laughs> well, it's always possible, but it, it seemed like it was real. Oh. Anybody th have any thoughts about it? I think it's getting, uh, it's more real than, um, it looks more real and looks more possible than some of the, the low cost arms that I've seen. I've seen a number of companies claim to come out with super cheap arms, and that's usually like the Kickstarter we're, price. We're talking about a robot dog, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, I know, but I'm just saying, like Chinese, in terms of like Chinese, you know, brand new products, I think it's it's cheaper and more likely to happen than some of the cheap arms that they have. That, that oh, some of the Chinese. Oh, I get it. Produce. I get it. Yeah. It's comparing Chinese, yeah, stuff that's coming yeah. out. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. All right, yeah. moving along. Any more robot news? I hey, have one. Uh, Jim, Jim, if you can find a link to the do uh, dog dog story there, post it in the chat. That'd be great. Yeah, go ahead, Dale. Um, RossCon has been canceled. It is now Ross World again for the second year in a row. That's they kind of gonna, awesome. 
Uh, they were going to meet in New Orleans, um, and they were really optimistic in January that they were going to be able to do it. But uh, people just are not able to, you know, in certain regions and demographics, just basically are not able to get themselves together. And so um, it's just they've determined that it is not safe. It's not possible with COVID going through the southeast and particularly Louisiana. Um, that it's just really just not safe. Um, and uh, I've kind of been following this because, you know, I know people, I know people who know people um, and, and we've cut, they've been kind of speculating for a while and, you know, internally I've heard them sort of hedging their bets. And then just this week they came out and said, yep, canceled in person. Um, it's just not safe again, but it's going to be online because they have all the infrastructure from last year. And so they're like, Hey, but isn't it cool that we can just, pivot this quick that we can just sort of flip on a dime to make it virtual again. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, it's not as good as being there, but you know what? It's good. Yeah. So Ross world, Ross con becomes Ross world. Okay. All right. Big news, big news there in the Ross world, <laughs> pun intended. All right. Moving right along club news. Um, next week is our business meeting. Uh, that'll be on the first Wednesday. Uh, and that's on the web page. Uh, did I post the link to our uh, mailing list? Everybody's on the mailing list, right? Uh, yeah, so that'll be the um, 1st of September where we talk about the business of um, homebrew robotics, which is uh, for the most part presentations. Uh, let me see here, did I get that in the chat? Oh, there's cyber dog stuff, Intel. Uh, yeah, I've got the uh, the link there for the um, mailing list. So everybody get on the mailing list, um, which brings me to um, uh, next month is our final challenge month of the year. It is uh, the HBRC challenge phase three. So I will be bugging you incessantly all month long about building your homebrewed robot you know you've got a robot you you know that it needs work it needs to be recharged uh it needs to be fixed it needs to be made better uh you need to show your we're a builder's club uh you need to get your robot out and and show it some love um don't take it personal when i post these things all month long i'm for the most part talking to myself okay so it's kind of like an internal dialogue but uh, get your robot out i know a lot of you guys are you know big league professionals and all that kind of thing but have some fun make a table bot make make something fun heck halloween's coming up halloween comes around every year you know make a nice uh, halloween i i've said this for the longest time is the roboticist holiday so you know make a halloween robot um, club news, any more club news out there? Chris, you've mentioned the um, NVIDIA meeting, physical meeting uh, in, um, listen, um, at um, uh, 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 bring up a Zoom link because, well, heck, the, the Ross discussion group will be meeting, well, we're, we're meeting at 7 p.m. So, uh, you know, bring up a, a Zoom meeting and actually use the, uh, the Zoom meeting from the, uh, uh, Ross discussion group on Tuesdays. We'll talk offline. Um, anybody else got some club news out there? Going once, going twice. Okay, now we're into the show and tell phase. Uh, we are the homebrewed, we are the homebrew robotics club. So this means you should be homebrewing robots. Who has something for show and tell? I have something fairly quick to just sort of show in, in person, I guess. Or Mark in, Johnson, ladies and gentlemen. In, in virtual person. Uh, I mentioned this briefly, but this is an old school, uh, old school sonar board with, uh, with a little uh, 3D printed holder to hold it and uh, be screwed through from the bottom. And then the, it uses the, uh, the Pi Pico, so uh, so it's a sort of just amusing little thing to have a subsystem that was. I needed something to do with the Pi Pico, so I did this anyway. I've already did, mentioned did, it on on the on the group, but just you, wanted to did show you it. Lay that board out. Yeah, this this is. Um, I do all my things 
um, now through uh, really low cost Chinese, <laughs> basically get the boards made in China and sent back and it comes out to be not too expensive and uh, do everything in KiCad. I'm still on five, I haven't moved to six, Wayne, <laughs> but I'm on five still and I do all my stuff in, in uh, KiCad five. To the best of my knowledge, KiCad six has not been officially released yet. And yeah, still... I, I, they, yeah, I know. I don't yeah, want to go. It'll there be until... it'll be it'll be right. It'll be released when it's done. It's good. This is a good open source strategy. And I the last I checked, they may say it may be at the end of the year or early next year. So just just to set expectations. Yeah, something like that. So anyway, what else, what else for show and tell? Hey, Camp, do, uh, should I play my uh, four minute, 20 second Oak D video? Yes. All right, here we go. Hey, Jim, give us the highlights on it, okay? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is your entry into uh, OpenCV contest, right? Yeah, so this was the entry to the open CV contest. It was a group of four of us, uh, three of us made robots. I used my already in progress uh, big orange, which had you know the Slam Tech Corporation uh, uh, SDP mini. Big and, orange, uh, I'm a big fan. Yeah, thank you. And it's got the uh, two Oak D's on it. Um, the Luxonis Oak D is the stereo AI camera. And one, the lower camera is for uh, uh, obstacle avoidance uh, using depth maps published to the uh, system and the upper cameras for the AI identification of objects and also depth uh, of an object to uh, navigate to it using the, the same system. So this is a, a slam tech has a full system for uh, navigation and map mapping and it's got an API so it's it's a uh, very it's easy to use um, relatively easy. Uh, through and through Python, we well we 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 crossed over an, uh, a C plus plus Python. Talk over it, okay? All right, here we go. So um, yeah, Brian Erickson, he built he and his uh, nephew. They built those two. This is orange. Um, they built theirs from scratch, so they were a little bit behind me. Um, I already had a robot, so I was in advantage. The whole thing was a, um, a five-month effort, uh, and there's it's, the contest has prizes and everything, and they're announcing the winners in a few weeks. So this was uh, the first two robots were completely ROS based, uh, and that's what this is showing you. Uh, mine is not, but we we, we did they did uh, get a uh, Oak D Ross, um, you know, com uh, by driver. Orange, take this to Jim in the office. Okay, I'll come get it. So here's the Oak D recognizing a person, um, and uh, Please place the object on my tray. Then it recognizes the bottle. Okay, I will take this bottle to Jim in the office. I'm going to the office. So here's the, this is the slam tech mapping. Uh, nothing new, we didn't add anything there, but this is, this is a, for illustrative purposes. And the, the, map, the house was fully mapped ahead of time. Uh, so it's... And here you can notice we forgot to put the, I forgot to put the bottle on for that. I had to I had to tape this in multiple multiple takes. <laughs> Did you account have... for the tray with the URDF model in order to miss that cabinet you turned around near? Actually, no. It, it's like um, on here's the, this is the uh, the map. That's, that's the depth map there. Go around these shoes. So that's sort of the example of using the depth map uh, but yeah the, i i adjusted the size of the robot to account for the tray so it's actually a bigger uh a bigger circumference or diameter or whatever yeah. 
Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Radius. <laughs> so that means the robot can't go in some places it used to be able to. So here. He's kind of say. Hello, Jim. So here I use just this search, a search algorithm to find a person. Jim, I have a bottle for you. Please take it. Thank you, Orange. You're welcome. Enjoy. And he, Orange detects whether the bottle is gone and that sort of thing. And here's the last, the second demo. Orange, where's the remote? So we had a, a... I see a remote. <laughs> this part you might have seen already. We had a, a nice volunteer uh, college age um, woman that did the editing for us. Carl's daughter. Thank you, Carl. I found the remote. Unfortunately, you can't pick it up yet. Thank you, Orange. <laughs> I need some help with an arm. Any, uh, so if anybody wants to help me, uh, <laughs> now I have my water and my remote. Jim the new Jim the new Jimcio, ladies and gentlemen, that's awesome, Jim. That is totally awesome. Yeah, and this, this was a team of people, and uh, you know, definitely mine just had to be. What, I got to the furthest point, but uh, thank you and uh, stop. Yeah, that's sharing. super awesome. That's great work. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I've got Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, I've got uh, a quick show and tell here. This is um, Kerbit, my Robo Magellan robot, and I've basically got it running uh, with the Arduino. So uh, there it goes. And there the, uh, the wheels go forward, reverse, clockwise, and counterclockwise. I'm using the... Uh, Hey, uh, Mike uh, Wimble, I got the um, two by seven um, RoboClaw working. Uh, I'm basically using the RoboClaw library from the uh, Arduino. Excellent. And there's a, there's a banana for scale there. I, I was thinking the banana was something really special, but apparently it's just to eat later. No, it's just for scale. <laughs> yeah. Because I show this and people, and, they, and, and, and then they realize that it's a big robot. They think it's a tabletop robot. <laughs> the banana could be the power source, or is that a potato? I think I've seen. <laughs> That's back to the future. Well, this is no, I mean, like... inches and centimeters. And it's like the official size of the banana for the banana. So there's that. Oh, and also uh, I've got the. Uh, the GPS happening. So there it's getting the kitchen. There it's getting the kitchen sink. Actually, I can share that. Not just everybody has a calibrated banana. <laughs> you know, maybe you should market those. <laughs> Might make more money than robots. And not as much construction problems. <laughs> Although with the way my demos go, it'll be the first banana to catch fire. What are we looking at here? A lot of data. It looks like GPS telling us the satellites and uh, where they are. The cap, are you talking? Because we're not hearing. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I've got the microphone up. Golly, you didn't even hear me talk through the demo, did you? <laughs> OK, so the wheels were going forward, reverse, clockwise, counterclockwise. And now we're looking at GPS data, uh, among which is the bearing uh, 0 through 359, 0 being north, 180 being south. Uh, and I'm committed to get this uh, robot curb it tracking north uh, by the um, challenge meeting uh, in September. 
uh, and that'll be September the 29th. All right, what else? Who else has a show and tell? Anybody? All right, let me quit sharing the screen here and we'll move to our presentation. All right. Um, so this month we've got uh, Chris Tacklin and uh, Chris is an engineer's engineer, a uh, keystone of Palo Alto. Uh, I've known Chris for at least 20 years. Um, he's uh, uh, one of the smartest people I know and one of the uh, nicest people I know. Now I know a lot of smart people that aren't necessarily nice. And I know a lot of nice people that aren't necessarily smart, uh, but you put the combination smart and nice together and you, you really got something. Um, Chris um, has been the technical lead in several startups in a wide range of industries from medical devices to robotics and transportation. <laughs> He's a prolific inventor with dozens of patents in many fields. He is particularly passionate about electromechanical design, education, and now modern control theory and, pra and practice. Uh, with that, Chris, uh, Chris Tacklin, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Camp. That was a very, very nice thing to say. You're very uh, welcome. As I, see, as I look at my face here, I realize I have to point out something right away. I, could, I didn't think you'd be able to see it in this little screen, but I managed to knock out a, a, a crown the other day. And I can either wear a little prosthetic or, or I can sound normal. You should, funny see, you should see the other guy. Yeah, it's, that's right. I think it was a, a part of a sailboat. Um, but yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for showing up for my little talk. And if you've been so unlucky as to be near me in the last year, like uh, uh, Dan and Brogan, that uh, uh, I rope you in the corner and, and start telling you the gospel of modern controls. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just it, well, Cameron's here all the time. He's been my co-conspirator. Um, uh, it's just it's so exciting. I just love to share it with anybody. So thanks for the chance to push me into formalizing a little bit to really explain everything. And hopefully you know, a bunch of you can actually use this information in your own robots. Uh, and so I'm not sure who all the folks are here today. Uh, so I'm going to start. Hold on. I'm going to, instead of using uh, a sharing my slides, I've got this little simple overhead camera. And I printed out my slides so I can write on. And uh, so I'll just switch through some piece of paper here. But to start out on uh, a common basis, uh, since we're all roboticists here, is to talk about uh, what we're familiar with, or at least where I started, was the idea of a PID controller. And you know, this is stuff I learned in school and I'm used all the time. And, uh, and I like uh, it's. Uh, it really is a lot of fun to, to make a servo system. This is the, the guts from a, a, a hobby servo. And just a quick refresher for the, the few people that haven't done this before. You know, if you have a, a lever and maybe you've got a belt that's going to a motor and you're trying to turn this lever uh, back and forth, you might call this the angle theta. Uh, and, and the torque that we apply to this motor Uh, we are familiar with is going to be proportional to the uh, the error uh, in theta um, times some gain of the proportional gain plus the error in the speed of theta times the derivative gain. So that's why we call it a, a PD controller and uh, the I is a, a, another subject. But uh, so getting one of these to work in your code, this is how simple the code is, just as one line to compute what, how hard you push. And uh, it's really fun when you get this working. It's, it's a great thing for students to do as well. There's nothing more exciting than getting it to work and have this, this little lever go zip, 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 you know, as quick as possible. But the problem is, there are a couple of problems. One is how in the world do you pick this P and D value? And we all have kind of ad hoc ways of doing it. And, uh, and they always leave a lot to be desired. And, uh, uh, but depending on which values you pick, you get you know, familiar different kinds of responses. If the, the gain is, the proportional gain is really high, it goes fast. And if it goes, wiggles too much and you add some more the, of the uh, derivative term that, that, that slows it down, it's called, we call that damping. 
Um, and that's about the, the range of what you can hope to get. And when it comes to doing a more complicated system, you know, we might have a servo system that controls a gripper at the, at the end of an arm. And we, and we know the gripper is small, so that can happen quickly, but that's at the end of a, an arm joint. And so we have, we have another PD controller controlling this, uh, this arm, and that happens a little bit slower than this, but that's on a big fat arm that's controlling the whole thing. And, and that happens really slowly. So we have another PD controller running that. And that's how we end up with these you know, typical eh, eh, kind of, of robotic motions that we're so used to. And I desperately wanted to get beyond that. And the, the uh, inspiration for wanting to get past that was hearing of these great results. Uh, and one that uh, really caught my attention almost a decade ago was hearing that a group at MIT uh, figured out how to take an overhead gantry crane and you know, if you ever had pleasure of using one of those, you've got a couple of buttons you push and it moves this big old giant piece of steel up in the, up in the rafters back and forth. And it's a big old heavy cable assembly hanging down. And of course your goal is to move the thing around uh, down on the, on the floor. But uh, every time you, you pulse this motor a little bit, this whole thing starts swinging because the pendulum. But they figured out how to control this thing so that you're, when you push the button, it tells the, this the bottom of the claw where to go and and it somehow moves this thing just the right way so that your controls move the thing you care about and i had no idea how to figure that out you, you can't do that with a bunch of uh, pd loops and not to mention you know all these crazy things coming out from boston dynamics you know how and the heck do they do this where does that all come from how, how do you possibly even get started with that uh, and so uh, I was determined, and I had a decade, <laughs> I guess, to work on it. But uh, I say one way to do it is to hire a, a crackerjack team. And I had the, actually had the pleasure of hiring the team that built this uh, Boeing Hummingbird. It's a 35 wing uh, foot wingspan helicopter, and these guys totally reinvented how helicopters worked. It doesn't even sound like a helicopter. And I asked, you know, hey, how in the world did you guys calculate all this stuff? She said, well, we just put six PhDs in a room and had them calculate for six months. And they sent out the prints and they made, had the shop made the parts. We bolted it together and we turned it on. I said, no, no, but how did you do that? And even though these guys were just absolutely brilliant, they had no idea how to explain that to me. You know, how, again, how do I even get started? And so these are, you know, incredible practitioners doing incredible work. Uh, you know, uh, you know, and this spectrum, you know, starting with the you know, gods like Newton, these people that, are, that figure out amazing things beyond what anyone else could hope to do. And I, and I never really liked this, uh, these books for things for dummies, you know, because we're not dummies, you know, for dummies is plug, you know, plug this number in here, do this. I'm looking for how do we understand what's going on so we can actually use it and appreciate it ourselves. And that's where I came up with this notion of a mere mortals. And uh, as I said, I really struggled with this because I had no idea where to start. And I swear, I, I started taking this great class called Under Actuated Robotics, I think three times at MIT. And of course, I never had time to do the homework. And I thought, oh, yeah, but I'll just watch the lectures and I'll get 90% of it. And, and it turns out I was really only getting about 10% of it because it, the, the, the depth of what he was talking about is so significant. And I, and I didn't even understand how little of it I was getting. It's still really great to watch. It's very inspirational. Uh, and if, if anything, watch his, uh, his first introductory lecture because it just goes over what, uh, where, what the amazing things are uh, that can be done with, with modern controls. But I finally really uh, hit pay dirt with this course called Controls Boot Camp. And this is a, a mere 47 lectures on trying to understand this stuff. And it's uh, uh, taught at a level for graduate students that have come from a very serious engineering background. And so it's pretty tough to follow what's going on. And I found myself going back and listening to lectures over again many times. In fact, uh, many times because he would go on to something and I get it, I get it, I get it. And then another thing, another thing, I get it. And then, wait a minute, how do all those things fit together? You know, what's, what's uh, trying to keep track and keep in your mind fresh, I think about five different things 
simultaneously was very difficult for me. And I still go back to his classes for reference sometimes. Um, and so he's, these two guys are my heroes. Um, so I want to start uh, with something that's very familiar to everybody who's here from uh, algebra. And, and this, I, but I, I like to call it bookkeeping as one of the first of these five really important ideas. And we don't usually give bookkeeping the credit that it deserves, but I guarantee you that when you start with a linear equation, uh, the first thing you write down is y equals mx plus b. And if you wanna find out what resistor you use, you know, the first thing you do is you write down v equals ir, because that's where your brain starts. And then you solve for r. Um, and, that's, and what we don't realize all the time, we don't normally call it bookkeeping, but that's what we're doing. And, but that bookkeeping is really important for us to understand uh, how to cast our problem, how to put the pieces of our problem into, uh, into a structure so that we can actually use the tools that we know to solve the problem. And so if uh, you know, the classic example for kids is, you know, I, I made $512 and I don't know how much I make per hour, uh, but I, I should, uh, how much I make per hour, uh, but I do know that I work for 10 hours uh, and I get 12 bucks for showing up. And so uh, we can, uh, because we all took algebra, we can use the tools we know uh, to solve for, uh, for M by doing some simple algebraic manipulations. And that's what we need to be able to do with controls is to have you know, a, way, a place to put all the complicated things, no matter how complicated they are, and still use the same tools to solve them. And so there's the framework. And literally every time I watch a lecture, I would start by writing this down so I could try to follow what's going on. And of course, none of this, uh, uh, only a few of you, does this mean anything at all? Because it, uh, and hopefully by the end of this, you'll understand what all these pieces mean. And again, th these are gonna be the places that we're gonna put all the important things to understand virtually any controls problem, uh, even really complicated controls problem. Um, so I'm gonna go through each piece uh, in some detail. So the first little piece of it is, I like to call is what happens. And in algebra, we had a relationship between X and Y, and that tells us everything that is. You know, if you've got an X, you got a Y, you got a Y, you got an X. It's all very straightforward. But this is a different kind of equation that tells you not what is, but what's going to happen. And a lot of you recognize this the funny symbology of this X dot. And uh, the meaning of this uh, is at the beginning of calculus. And um, so let me derive, let's see, a piece of paper I want to use. If um, I can put on this piece of paper. So uh, what's not explicitly mentioned here is that uh, x is a, a function of time uh, that I, I'm implying by this dot here. And again, we don't know what x of, uh, what x of time is, but it, it's going, something is going to happen. And the tradition to, to draw a nice little graph like this, that here's time, here's x, and maybe you start here. And I want to know, well, what's going to happen next to, uh, to X do this, 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 I don't know, it's, it's going to do something. And that's what we're trying to, uh, trying to describe with this incredibly simple equation. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a bit the, some, if you know, if you took a college course in differential equations, you might remember that you can actually write down the answer to this uh, uh, in continuous time. But I, uh, most people that take a whole year of college calculus could probably not even remember how to do that because it's just, it's just not all that helpful, it turns out. And spending a whole year uh, trying to find closed form solutions to things just doesn't really work in the real world. It's just not helpful at all. So I'm gonna jump right to a, a, a discrete version of this. And that's a lot easier to understand. So uh, in this graph here, suppose you know, that X looks something like this. And so at a particular time, you're gonna have, uh, the nth value of x. And then another time, you can have the x plus one or n plus one uh, value and at some other time. Does that make sense? That this, I mean, that, that's a picture of, of what happens to x over time. Yeah. And so, and so uh, this notation here for, for people who haven't had calculus just uh, almost literally means 
that if you take the x of, at time n plus one and subtract the x sub n and divide by the change in time, that's equal to a times x sub n, where the, um, so the, this equation is saying that the derivative, the, ch the change, the change in x divided by the change in time is equal to some constant times the value where you are. Does that make sense? Yeah, I've got a couple of nods. Well, so now we do a, a tiny bit of algebra um, and x, uh, so x of n plus one uh, is equal to delta t a x sub n, oops, um, um, plus x sub n. So I just I did multiplied through by the by delta t and then brought the minus x n, it becomes a plus x n. And so x sub n plus one is equal to delta t times a plus one times x sub n. So, and when it comes to robotics, this is exactly what you want to know. That if I have a value of where I am, if I multiply by this number here, and I call this uh, uh, a discrete ad, uh, just take that, multiply it by this, I get the next value. It's that simple. That's what's going to happen. And now, what happens if, uh, if this ad number is one? I'm actually looking forward to doing this with a group of uh, junior high school kids in an algebra class. And you know, so what if you multiply x sub n times one over and over again? It, nothing happens, it just sits still. What happens if AD is bigger than one? You know, if it's two, then and the x sub n becomes twice as big and then twice as big and twice as big. And so it just, uh, it just blows up. But if, x, if, if AD is less than one, then every time you multiply by something less than one, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so that's gonna be a function that goes down to zero. And this notion of going down to zero is exactly the, uh, the idea of stability. If something's gonna blow up, oscillate away, that's unstable. But if it comes down, it stops at the right place. That's exactly the idea of stability. Exactly what we talk about in, in stability in our robots. You know, does the robot stop at the right place? Does the oscillation stop? It's all in, encompassed in this one simple equation. Of course, I'm simplifying things a lot. I'm, I'm going to get to the bigger details soon. Um, so another import, important part of, the, of the, those equations is uh, uh, call, I like to call it encapsulation. Uh, a lot of uh, modern programming, the C++, et cetera, is about encapsulating things into objects. So instead of having 20 different variables, you have one object and it has 20 different pieces. That's a really important idea of modern programming. And in, and in modern controls, is a similar idea where in this equation, uh, talk about this Y value, that's where we're gonna encapsulate the, uh, the things that we measure. And this equation is saying that the things we measure is something times where we are. And, and I'm gonna, for now, I'm gonna ignore this. So we'll get to that later, perhaps. And so where uh, the measurement we get is just something times where we are. That's exactly that linear, linear equation. And so you'd be tempted to say, oh, well, gee, then I guess that where we really are is just uh, uh, y divided by c. Turns out yeah, that's not gonna work out too well. And we'll find out why in a minute, because it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and as an example, if something's just a little bit more complicated, uh, just a little more complicated, you know, if you want to make a Segway robot, you got a, a wheel rolling on the ground, you've got a, a body up in the air, and you've got something that measures the angle between the, the, uh, the wheel and the body. Let's call that alpha. And uh, so the alpha as a function of time is, uh, has to do with the position that you move, the x of time. And it happens to be scaled by the radius uh, plus the, the pitch uh, angle. That's how far you've actually fallen over, how far you're leaning forward. And so it's uh, so the pitch is a function of time. And in our robot systems, 
things are always scaled too. You know, the, the output of your sensor, it doesn't read a radians necessarily. And so uh, if you want to, if your sensor happens to read in one turn uh, is one count, is one full turn is, is a one, then you've got to scale this by uh, uh, pi over two. And so that would be a typical measurement you would get for a, for a Segway kind of robot. And, uh, and you can see right away that I can't use algebra on here to tell me that if I have this, what are both of those things? Because they're both mixed up. So that's, so that's it. Uh, why that uh, earlier idea didn't work, but it's okay. We're, we're going to get there. Uh, but actually, before we get there, we're going to get more complicated. Uh, what happens if you add more sensors? And so we already had uh, that alpha of t is something, but now what if we have another sensor uh, that we'll call uh, the, the gyro of t? And, the, and these little gyros that we buy uh, it's kind of a funny term, it's not very accurate, but what they're sensitive to is the, uh, is the rate of change of the angle. And so uh, the rate of change of the angle, uh, we, what we call that pitch. And so the, and it's the, this calculus notation is called pitch dot of T. So it's the rate that the pitch is changing is what the gyro is. And we already had that uh, the alpha of T is, uh, one, say x of t over r plus pitch of t, that whole thing times uh, pi over two. So now we've got two equations to describe what we measure, but we wanna encapsulate this into y, the thing we call y. And so I'm gonna write that as that y of t is alpha of t uh, and gy uh, gyro uh, of t as this vertical stack of two different things. And I'm gonna say that that is gonna be equal to something that depends uh, on, the, on, on the different measurements. And we already had the measure, or it should be the different parts of what our robot is doing. And, uh, and that's the, the notion of a state of our robot. To describe the state that our robot is in, we, we already talked about the, uh, the position x is part of the state. And there's also the velocity of x and there's the pitch. And here we're using the pitch dot. And so those four things do a nice job of describing our, our robot. And now what, what goes in between here to describe, to get this thing here? Well, when it comes to getting the gyro rate, that's just the pitch. And so if we, if we multiply, if we make up something to put in here, how about we put a zero, 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 one here? And if I take this, this four things times that bottom line, that gives me zero plus uh, zero, zero, zero plus one of those, it gives me the gyro output. And likewise for the, uh, for the alpha, uh, it's a combination here of this and this, and that's exactly uh, pi over two r, zero, and then some of the pitch. It's just uh, pi over two of the pitch and a zero. So this is a, a, a pretty much a made up notation for describing the system of equations. And it, uh, you can have lots of different equations and the size of these, uh, of this matrix and this vector and the state vector just scale up with the size of your, pro of your problem. And so, so here I've introduced the idea of a state vector uh, and, uh, and a matrix. And this is exactly what we called C. So this is Y equals C X. Does that make sense? Yeah, a few nods there. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> Yes, Camp, you getting it? Every word. All right. Well, so now we're gonna get some real meat here because remember we talked about that first line of the equation of our system of our bookkeeping was this X dot of sub N plus one is A discrete times X sub N. But what does it mean when X sub N is a vector? 
that's that this is a bigger beast here. And this is saying, so, uh, so if we're gonna take uh, X sub N, let's to make, a, make this a little more compact, we'll, we'll call it uh, the position X, the, the time, you know, the velocity and the angle and the angle dot. So what's the, the, the derivative of X N is just X dot, X double dot, theta dot, theta, uh, th shoot, theta dot, theta double dot. And so that means this whole equation, this equation becomes x dot, x double dot, theta dot, theta double dot equals some big thing times the, the original state, x, x dot, theta, theta dot. So now we got to fill in this thing in here so that to make this equation be true. And so what's the shape of this thing? It's actually you know, related to the example for C, but you can see that it's got to have four, this is four wide, and it's got to have an output four times. So this thing has to have four by four, 16 different values in it to describe what's going to happen to this. Does that, does that make sense? I hope that's sufficiently motivated. Um, yes. And, and you can see how, jump, let me jump ahead a tiny bit. What if what if the vector were bigger? This is just describing you know, uh, one segue arm. What if you had another arm? And it, that just makes the vector bigger and just makes the, the, the A bigger. And all the arithmetic is still the same. The same one little equation still holds. And then when it comes to your code, you just have, you know, you have an A matrix that's in your code and you've got an X vector and your, your control law uh, will end up just being these simple multiplies of these simple looking things, but and each one of them is encapsulating these big ideas. So next, um, well, so here's the first scary word because these things are always full of scary words. And I, a lot of people have heard of this thing called an eigenvalue. And remember we said that, uh, that A had to be less than one to be stable. But what does it mean for something like what does it mean for that thing to be less than one? So it, somebody had to make up a new idea. And it turns out, you know, there have been classes that we, a lot of us have taken in college that we quickly forgot. But it turns out this this mad, this scary old word is uh, it turns out those are exactly the things that have to be less than zero, that have to be less than one. And the uh, eigenvalues are this uh, funny thing. If you, if you want to write down the definition, it's just that if you have a vector uh, and if you multiply it by some constant, you get the same thing as multiplying it by, uh, by the A thing. It, like, there's no intuition in there that helps me. When you're, there's, there are ways of, of, that's useful for basis sets and extrapol or ex expanding things, but I, I don't find that very helpful. Um, but what is helpful is that in, practic uh, in practical work, uh, you can, all you need to do is use modern uh, uh, math tools that we all have for free. You just use the expression uh, EIGS of A and uh, uh, MATLAB or Octave will just give you the, the eigenvalues, boom. Now, if you took an algebra, a, a linear algebra class, they might uh, make you find the eigenvalues for a three by three, because that's really a pain in the ass. But they'll never torture you to, make, to find the eigenvalues for a four by four, because it's just too hard. Uh, and, and of course, in a math class, they'll only give you ones that come out nice and easy. Not to mention the fact that these, these eigenvalues are actually complex numbers, usually. A lot of you are familiar with complex numbers. Uh, but uh, and so it's really the absolute value of the eigs have to be less than one for, for a system to be stable. And that's it. It's just, you know, that's the one thing that makes the whole system stable. Um, you have to worry about the thing blowing up on you. So um, let's actually do a real example. Uh, we're gonna take that uh, scary thing, I didn't call it scary before, that differential equation idea so, but a lot of us are familiar with, familiar with the expression F equals MA. 
and uh, and some of us you know have had to use this and do something with it but it's uh, uh but a is really a shorthand for if we take if x is the position then the the speed of x uh, we call that x dot and the acceleration of x is just x double dot a little familiar the things that we've been using in our state vectors and so this first equation here is that the force is equal to mass times the, uh, the x double dot. And for this example, uh, or, or for a common example for a, a system, let's imagine here's our mass and I'm gonna have a spring attaching it to the wall and the spring has a constant k. And so uh, force equals minus kx means that if this is the x position, the spring is going to exert a force backwards proportional to what x is. That may, that, that's you know, what that means. And so now uh, we have uh, two equations uh, that f is this and f is this. And so we're, we can write down the mx double dot is equal to minus kx. And so this is an example of uh, a, a class of differential equations. Again, it doesn't tell us what is. It tells us what's going to happen. Now, how are we going to tease that out and actually use it for something? Uh, well, let's let's see. Let's use our notation. So we're going to have uh, this is just a one-dimensional one thing. So our state vector is uh, x vector is just x and x dot. Um, and so our first equation just is x dot x double dot. Remember that's the, the x dot thing. Uh, equals a x. So it's going to be a something in here times our x vector, just x x dot. All right. So now we got to fill in this a here. So what's what's that? What's going to fill on that a? Well, the first line's easy because if you take this times something, you have to get x dot, and that's all. So that first line just has to be zero and one. And, uh, and this one here, x double dot, has to be is something, some combination of these things. Hmm, let's see here, x double dot. If we solve that, that's just x double dot is just minus k over m times x. And so hmm, double dot is going to, there's none of the x's here, but there is a minus k over m. And that's our a discrete. That just completely describes what's going to happen. And uh, I think it's time to, uh, for a quick software demo to convince you of that. Um, let's see here. So um, let me share my screen. Cameron tells me I got those two backwards. Uh, let's see, share my screen, this one over here, uh, share. So I, I mentioned modern software tools and uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with MATLAB. Good. I'll kind of check, make sure you're seeing it okay. You see my my MATLAB or my Octave or MATLAB? You might want to increase the font size if you can. Um, I don't know how to. Do yeah, that. increasing the font size would really help. Usually, you do that with the uh, little under view menu, or use the uh, the wheel on the mouse with Control if it's Windows. You can drop the resolution you know of your screen. Might be able to do just that one window. And that would do it. Mm. The graphs. Yeah, I think that yeah, share. So mm. now, now you can see just this one window. And so if I make that small, it'll fill your screen. Is that right? That's better. Except it's not going to show in the plot. Um, shoot. Is that a, a math? crunching program or what is that? Yeah, so uh, MATLAB is a famous program. Uh, they sponsor NPR shows and 
Mm -hmm. uh, and Simulink is another one of their products. And it's just mm -hmm. a, a simple program. Well, it's a big program, I guess, nowadays for, uh, for doing mathematics. And I wouldn't say mathematics, we're doing calculations. Uh, looks like we lost it here. Let's go on. Announce it's going your so then you would set up your formula and then you can crunch the numbers. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, here, can you can you read this? Oh shoot. No. Um, I could point this camera at it. You could. That would work. That works. That's okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's all washed no, out. That's not, that's not gonna work. <laughs> you yeah. can use the um, all yellow. The control. Well, it's it actually. It, uh, Mouse um, wheel, control mouse wheel. He's had it a second ago. It looked really well, yeah, good. But, oh, there, he's got it. Here we go. Control, uh, or you can use the view menu, probably. How's this? Oh, that's better. That's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Control yeah. mouse wheel, right? All right, so, uh, yeah. so this is a, oh, I, I want to okay. show. Yeah, 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 it's a form, yeah. You see here, cool. here's A. Right, this is right. how, you're, your how you write a two by two matrix mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, the mass here are these all very familiar looking things right, and right. the and the a discrete is the isn't the uh, second row an a backwards from what you showed us it is i made a mistake before okay i do that a lot um a good catch uh anyway so the, so here's the a that we derived and by the way uh, there's also a, a, an important distinction between continuous time and discrete time because that you know the, the um, when I did the derivation, I was talking about a continuous time function. You know, when I drew the cur the smooth curve, but then we, whenever it's convenient, we make the, the conversion to uh, to a discrete version. And here's that arithmetic I showed you. Uh, and oh, uh, yeah, yeah. dt times a. Mm -hmm. uh, a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you know, a is this. You know, uh, 16 things here, and you multiply by dt, just multiplying every element by dt. But then if you want to add one, what does that mean? Well, it, since this is a matrix, you have to add uh, what's called uh, an identity matrix. So this is the equivalent of a one. So when you add, so that just means that on the diagonal, you add a one to each of them to get the discrete version. And that's what line 14 does here. Oh, is that is that clear? That's and so a cool and so, that's a cool program. I like that. It is. It, and by the way, this is Octave, and it's free. It's a it's a function by function replica of of MATLAB. So this is all I use. And and as a button up here, a little a little run button. I'll run this uh, this little program, and change directory, and it just ran that program. And here's the output. Um, it, what, you know, one more important note here. So, in, uh, so th this is just my housekeeping of you know, starting it. I start with that counter of one, go for a full 10 seconds. The first, uh, the first value. We're not uh, seeing what you think we're seeing. Well, can you see what I select? We're not yeah. seeing a plot. Oh, but I yeah, just hit, a, I just hit the plot. plot. And it went away. Right, well, here, I can, I can fix that. Because I will try to show you the code now, not... Uh, this, we share the wrong screen. I'm showing this whole thing, right? I'm showing this right now. Um, We're just seeing the code. I, we see the octave window. An old desktop. We're not I see yeah, this whole window here. We shared the wrong screen. Different window. Hey. Now do you see it? There it is. Okay. Wow. There, there you go. Okay. And uh, so. Uh, so here's the code, here's the output, the little graph. And uh, it's, this program almost couldn't be any simpler that uh, we have a little counter that we're all familiar with. Uh, the, the time value is just n times dt. And here's that, uh, this is a, the notation for a vector. It's just a discrete times the previous one. And, that, and it just marches through that and fills up the vector and then we plot them. Couldn't be simpler. And we get this nice, uh, uh, simple sine, uh, sine wave. And you see, we then started- under, at, stand line 13, the I of two. Uh, I would have thought- oh, I, that's, uh, that's how MATLAB writes it. Uh, so a, that was a plot identity. of the, the equation there or something I oh. just saw? Uh, Look like a graph. This, yeah, this is the output chart. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, wow. 
I'm sorry. Let, let him. Yeah, so, what was let, I? Let me, can you still see my paper too? Yes. Um, you can still see my paper. So, I could, uh, so a discrete is equal to uh, you know, dt times the a matrix uh, plus the uh, identity matrix, which is one one zero zero in this case, and that's this. This is shorthand for uh, eye. Uh, eye oh, two. So that, that that's that just how you your, the plots your matrix there. No, no, that's not plot. The plotting is just down here. We're going to plot oh. uh, x as a function of time, uh -huh. and then we're going to the first element of x, and then the, mm. the second element, oh. which is the, the he's the saying x i two i two is a two by two, and it's an identity matrix, and that's just their shorthand for it. That's correct. That's exactly correct. But one more thing I want to show here. So here's the here's where x starts. That for the for n equals one, the first value of x. The complete uh, vector that, that this their funny notation here is I started at one and zero, so that so x is zero. Excuse me, x is one and x dot is zero. And if you look at the chart here, you can see we've got x and x dot. Uh, okay. Yeah, so you can see that uh, x starts at one, and then oscillates down to minus one, and the x dot starts at zero. Now, if I, I can run this again, I can change these values. I'm going to say, what if uh, uh, if uh, x dot starts at minus one, and just run it again? And, and now you can see that x started at one, and x dot started at minus one. So this says that if the pendulum, this is a uh, uh, this the, the mass is going like this. So if you start with the mass uh, uh, in at position one, but it's going really fast in this direction. Uh, uh, it's going to keep going uh, in that direction uh, and, and go through this oscillation. But, uh, but there's actually another point I want to make here is now what happens if you have a different dynamic? You know, A is just a particular dynamic system. Well, let's, let's do a, a different one. Oh, I like um, this math program. Isn't it great? Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna, well, you won't believe what we do with it, too. Um, so let's take that same example uh, of, the, of the spring and a, a mass. And, and this is you know, a very traditional um, right out of a textbook problem. So we've got K that describes the force. So the, uh, the force from the spring is minus K times X. Now, here's our X position. Uh, but what if we also add another uh, term that we call damping. And so uh, if there's a, if it's sliding, then that there's another force that uh, the force due to, to, uh, to drag is gonna be again in the minus direction. Uh, so it's called minus C, but it's proportional to the velocity, to the speed. Hmm. So I've now just added another force. So this is a whole different system. And so something different is gonna happen. And so in matrix form, um, Except for when, when this thing stops, you'll have a static coefficient of friction. But we'll right. ignore that for the time being. Well, no, that's exactly right. A, but uh, uh, when damping is proportional to the speed, and so when there's no speed, there's no damping force. So here I'm going to pull up another, uh, just rather than change the, um, I'm going to close this example and pull up another simple example. And this is exactly the same. How did you zoom in, Cameron? Control and scroll. I can't hear you. Great. So this is exactly the same, except that uh, I've modified the A matrix and added this minus CM. So, oh. uh, uh, right? That's all the only difference. I added another force term. That's for, uh, and so now if we run this system, we get a plot like this. Oh, you can see it. The damping made it, yeah, made it, looks it like, a, like a damp oscillator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, damping, damping. You know, and this is this is exactly the stuff we're dealing with when making a, a a single degree of freedom servo, a toy servo. And again, with this program now, you can modify everything you want. You can start a different place. You can start with well, let's make the damping uh, a lot higher. Let's say let's make this well, let's make it uh, four times higher and run it again. Look at that critical damp. 
or if we have too little damping, um, well, point uh, and run it again. So now it oscillates a lot longer. And of course, there's also the what's the effect of the mass and the spring constant? What if you make the the mass uh, half as big? That changes the frequency. So, so this tool lets you experiment with anything you want, and it's all and we're using all this matrix notation and vector notation. So it doesn't matter how big those matrices are, it's still going to handle it just fine. You don't have to introduce any new variables or any new variable names practically. And, uh, and you can, I, what am I missing? I thought a pendulum's oscillation was independent of the weight of the pendulum. Is uh, it the not when it comes. Pressure? Now, when it's this is not a pendulum, this is a mass being pushed by a spring. So it does matter. The mass does matter, but you're exactly right. For a pendulum, you could do that. You could find the right. Uh, you could find an A matrix for a pendulum, and explore that. Well, funny you should say that because that's what we're going to do next. The pendulum is a fantastic example, um, and. And actually, uh, this is a, uh, the, the humor portion of the, of the, the lecture. It's a, not all systems are as simple as a, a mass spring. Uh, they're not all as simple as a segue. Um, but yeah, so here's an equation from deriving the equations for a segue. It's gonna be a quiz later. And this is just one, one of the four differential equations. This, if you could read this, this is saying that uh, x double dot is, and it's all of these sines and cosines and products and everything. And people that are, you know, you know schooled in making up examples for class, uh, they immediately by hand go through and say, well, wait a minute, every place there's a cosine of zero, uh, well, that's equal to zero. And so every place there's a cosine of zero, you do get to knock out that whole term, that whole line. And every place there's, there's a sine of zero, right, uh, that's just equal to one. And so you get to uh, replace this, you just get to wipe out the sine of zero and, and you start knocking this thing down until you get down to the essence of what's left. And you end up with something uh, very reasonable. I mean, I jump ahead ever so slightly. It ends up for a uh, for a segue. This is the uh, pendulum A matrix, nice and simple. That literally came from this pile of math. And actually, we don't have time to, to get into it uh, tonight. But uh, using uh, another math program is what, you can do lots of ways, I suppose. But the one I use is Mathematica. And Mathematica generates this equation and does all its simplification all in seconds. This is over. There's no, no fussing around with algebra, no mistakes. You, if you find one little, one little thing you need to change, boom, it just does it over again. And it's not a, it's hours of uh, rederiving it. And this was can actually- I Can I request that you zoom in on the left-hand side so that way we can look at this and study it later? This one here? I, there you go, that's a good zoom, very nice. Okay, I think we've captured it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, um, well, and but there's actually one more little piece here that I I glossed over is the idea of linearization as well. You know, sure, you can get rid of a lot of the complexity with with things like this. Uh, there are also things you can do if if a if you know that delta x is small, then you know that delta x squared is very small. Again, that's all somebody being smart, but. Uh, when it comes down to it, remember the, the output vector or the, the x dot is just some function of, of, the, of the input thing. It's just some function. Uh, and so this is again shorthand for the sum of all the pieces of this equal one of these pieces. And so for each one of those uh, elements in, the, um, in that vector, it represents a, in this case, we're talking about the pendulum. Uh, it's, it's a, this is a four dimensional thing. So imagine a four dimensional surface and it has some shape. And if you look at, you know, so here's a surface that has some shape to it. And if this is uh, along the direction of X, then all we're looking for is what's the slope? What's the, the tangent right here in that X direction? And what's the, the slope 
in the, uh, the x dot direction. And you have to do that in four dimensions. Well, mathematically, that's a very simple operation. Uh, it happens to be called a partial derivative. Um, but again, that's just something that modern software could do for you in a heartbeat. And to find this equation is a, a, a single line of code in Mathematica, which is uh, the derivative of the uh, equations, uh, I forget the notation, uh, with regards to the state. That's something that simple. And it, and it turns out page after page of here's the answer. And uh, I like to write here the answer. And then if you just uh, uh, you say, give me the answer with all these values plugged into it, uh, you get all the way down to, this is what I care about. Those are the numbers that go into my controller to drive my robot. I, don't, I didn't have to do any of the algebra by hand because we, we have modern math tools. Um, all right, I beat you up enough on that. So, because uh, those are all the pieces we Can need we to actually- Can we get a zoom in on that screen, on that uh, matrix? That's, yeah, some random four by four matrix. And we're gonna see some more of those in, in real examples here soon. Um, but there's two more really important ideas. Uh, uh, again, a scary word is a, a full state controller. Well, when we made a, a PD controller, the full state was X and X and this that was the position and the velocity. And we had a, a proportional uh, gain term and a derivative gain term. So this really was a full state controller, which is just saying that if we, uh, we take everything we know about where we are to determine how hard we should push that's the, kind of the best we could do, right? And uh, so I'm gonna, uh, so for, in that first equation that we started out with, uh, x dot equals ax plus bu, finally we're gonna look at this, what does this bu thing mean? And so, and u is, is literally, you know, the pushes. And so uh, a full state uh, controller just means that we're going to have u be some constant, uh, I'll call it constant sub r for regulator, uh, times the the state vector. So, and uh, let me give you a concrete example before we move on. Suppose that uh, in a Segway bot, you only have one motor. So there's only one thing you're pushing on. And uh, the, uh, so, you know, you're just pushing uh, between the, the body and the wheel, right? And so the, uh, in, that, in that case, you'd have x dot uh, equals ax plus and, and b would look like this. Well, actually, let me be very explicit here. This is, I think, important. x dot, x double dot, theta dot, theta double dot. So that's, that's the x dot thing. So it's a times x, x dot, theta, theta dot. So now we're gonna add to that something that's gonna look uh, the right shape, right? If, if this is a two by two times a, a one by four, so it's gonna look like this. But the thing we have over here, it's gotta end up looking like this too. And so uh, the, in the form that B takes in that particular case, uh, if U is just a, a scalar, at the, and when you push on something, uh, it rattles all the way through to the acceleration. And so the B happens to look like this. And, and it also, since you, you're, that motor is between your stick, your body and your wheel, so it's pushing on the opposite direction on the theta double dot. And so it's here, zero and a minus one here. Does that make sense? You know, and getting, Getting familiar with the shapes and things is, is one of the many hard parts of this. Like, wait, what is this? How, what's the shape of that? And um, so, so I wanted to have a very explicit example of what that was. But now let's finish with the algebra here that uh, you know, x dot is ax, but now we're going to substitute this in uh, for u plus b times 
kr times x. And uh, so now we're gonna, we do a little algebra here. Uh, so a, uh, a, yes, plus b kr times x. So this is just another a, and I'll call it a sub r for, for a regulator. This, and this is just another dynamic system that has, and it's all of its behavior is determined by this one thing, AR. And it does something. You know, and remember we, when we adjusted the A value in the an octave, depending on what the values were in the A matrix, that's what happens. And so uh, this completely described what's gonna happen. But of course, now we get to pick what these, what these gains are here. And uh, oh, I didn't explicitly say here. That, so if U, is K, uh, kr times x, what, what's the shape of kr? So if x is this four thing, then the kr has to be a four thing this way, so that you end up with just a number. Is that on the screen? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so now we wanna know uh, what about the dynamics of this? Of course, the stability is gonna be as determined by what the values of the eigenvalues are. That's, uh, we, we know how to take care of that, but now, we can ask ourselves, uh, what, how in the world should we choose those values? You can pick the, uh, if you pick those Ks, you know, so that you pick the gains to be anything you want, but then that means you get some particular eigenvalues. Or wouldn't it be great if you could somehow pick the behavior you wanted instead of just picking these numbers? So this is uh, the second to last really big important result here. Um, in fact, it's, uh, 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 if we had a bunch more time, I could drag you through. There are lots of simulators online for an inverted pendulum. And, uh, and to make that, uh, or uh, yeah, an inverted pendulum, like Segway. And there are four different K values. And they'll magically say, oh, here, use these values. And hey, it works great. But if you start twiddling those values, it all goes to hell. If you get anything wrong, it all falls apart. And, and, I, and I've never been able to get back from trying to twiddle those values by hand. It's, it's you know, trying to find the right values is, is a non-trivial thing. Much worse than trying to just find a P and a D value. You're trying to find all four of them simultaneously is almost impossible. Um, and so wouldn't it be great if we could do that? So here's uh, the uh, one of the last scary words is, a linear quadratic regulator. And the idea here is, again, we're gonna to try to pick the values for the, uh, for the, the values for the regulator, which in, in our example is you know, four numbers. And, uh, but uh, what we're gonna introduce is the idea of, hmm, uh, in our time history, if you know, X does this, this is X of time, and here's our time. If, if it's expensive to push X around like this, we'd like to have something that measures how, how much did we spend over time. And so a really nice uh, method or, or measure how much X you spent is to look at how much X squared you have, because that takes care of uh, if the values are negative or not. And, um, but there, were, there are also ex expense in, well, how much did you push? If this is the how much you push was a function of time, you know. So uh, and, uh, again, uh, a nice measure of how much you push over time would be uh, the, the u value squared over time. And you know, now you're going to use some real calculus ideas that you need to add up those things over time, and you need to add them up forever. What you know, if you the expense of making your system run from time zero to time forever. You wanna make those as small, uh, choose these four numbers so those are as small as possible. And the, and the, the uh, I hate to write the calculus down, but um, the, the official expression that's used is uh, if you have uh, a weighting function times the uh, X transpose times X plus the U transpose times R times U, and you integrate from from zero time to infinite, infinite time, uh, if you make this as small as possible, you're gonna get the best values here. How the heck are you supposed to do that? 
Well, it turns out with this particular choice of, uh, of uh, squared functions of X and U, one of those gods of, ro of uh, robotics or of controls found a closed form answer. Don't ask me how. And so, so you can do um, in MATLAB or in Octave, you can use a function that, they, that somebody's written called LQR of A and B and Q and R, and it'll return the gains. So it's that easy to implement. Instead of trying to integrate that whole thing, twiddle the value, integrate the whole thing again, that, that's hopeless. Somebody's done all that work for us and found a very simple way to do that and calculates this uh, rather instantly. And so uh, back up again. So we have a full state controller. Um, I'm not too excited. Yeah. I'll just write it again. So we got, uh, we've got a, a full state controller so that x dot is ax, uh, it's gonna be, is it uh, a plus b minus b k regulator times x. And so we, uh, this function, this, this function called LQR gives us those values. So the dynamics of this minimize the, uh, the x cost and the pushing cost. Boom, done. And by the way, this, the shape of this Q here uh, depends on the shape of X. And so a, a typical Q might be, uh, again, you've got X, X dot, theta, theta dot. So if I, if I care a little bit about X and I, and, and I, or, uh, I, I care a lot about the velocity, and I don't really care much about the angle, but I really care about, the, uh, about how fast the angle is changing. Thank you. This, that's what the, that Q looks like. It's a four by, four by four matrix with the numbers that we care about on the diagonal. And again, so it all scales with the, with the size of the, of the vectors, but, uh, but all, your, all your expressions in your, your code look identical. So you, um, had to come up with, you had to come up with Q and R. So. You get to choose Q and R because mm. that's, that's your expression of how much you care mm. about the different things. And so, and by, by given that choice, boom, it gives you the gains you want right out of the box, just done, no fussing around. And so there's one more thing, we're gonna use exactly the same ideas on one more dynamic system, and then we'll do a, uh, do a demo. Um, and, uh, and, it, and that's the idea of an estimator. And an estimate, you know, and this, uh, when you had a, a when you have a a simple system that you're you're measuring the angle of the arm, you know you're measuring theta. Oops, you're, yeah, you're just measuring that you got a potentiometer you're on right, it. And so you're, you're writing off screen, Chris. Uh, sorry, uh, hit yourself a little high. There we go. Yeah. Um, so when you have a potentiometer, you're you're measuring an angle. Let's call it theta. But so but what's the derivative of theta? Well, you know, from our calculus lesson, we can say, well, theta looks like this. And so we'll take this one, this one, and divide, take the change and the change of time. But it turns out in our software, when we take a derivative by taking a, 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 a finite step like that, we really amplify the noise in our, in our sensor. It's really a disaster. So there's, this is really not very satisfying to, uh, by hand, try to make up an estimate for each thing. Um, so we're going to do a much better, a much better job of that, and make it completely systematic, so it all just happens. And uh, the uh, kind of industry standard for an estimator is a is a symbol of a hat. I don't know where that came from. So it's the same vector, but it's the estimate version of it. So we're going to make a new dynamic system. X uh, x hat dot is just a times x hat uh, plus b times how much you're pushing. But there's another thing that we're uh, our estimate is getting pushed around by is uh, a, the difference between what, uh, the, what's really measured and our estimate of what we measure times some estimator. 
grain, uh, estimator gain. And uh, uh, jump ahead ever so slightly, you, know, you can see this is exactly the same form that we had before, where you know, this is, uh, uh, well, let me, do, let me do a couple, a little bit more arithmetic first, then I'll show you that. Now this y hat is the same thing as, uh, as y, but it's just c times the, the real y. And so now we can replace, um, uh, get that right. Yes. So now I'm going to uh, use this to replace this y hat here. So can x you, dot. Can you explain why is just a constant times y? Um, well, that's what we're going to. That's what we're going to. We're going to find is what's the best uh, of scaling of our measurements that we could possibly use that will make our estimate as good as possible. Yeah, and so, uh, uh, and we're going to use that same LQR idea to find these gains for us that gives us the best possible estimate for the entire system, given just the few, the few readings that we have. So let me finish the algebra here is AX hat plus BU plus KE times Y, oops, KE times Y, oh yeah, KE is on Y, uh, minus KE, and this uh, Y hat is just CY, and I'm going to write this just a little bit funny here. Um, and this could be, I'm going to write this as um, B K times this new vector made up of U and Y. Does that make this, that's a little bit hard to swallow. Because this is a concatenation of these two different matrices and well, these two well. vectors stack together to make a new, a, new, a new vector, but it's exactly the same form again. That this is, you know, we have an A and we have um, a B thing and we have a, a U thing. It's exactly the same form. It, so now- This uh, equation you just wrote, I don't see where the uh, K, ah. uh, KCY uh, comes into it. Ever so slight. We had an equation for x before, not x hat. Here we go. Um, oh, I didn't write it. Oh no, it's in the full <laughs> state. Term so far, we don't know why you dropped the term. Sorry. I think he's saying that you dropped the term and we don't know why you dropped the term. Yeah, the, the minus K E C Y, that's not in that no, that next one, is it? Well, K, yeah, so this times this is exactly that. Uh, wait, 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 wait. No wait. C in there. That that's no, that's uh wait, wait, you're right. You're right. I I've made a mistake here. I made a mistake here. Um You guys are really keeping me. So maybe the segues don't work after all. Maybe. <laughs> Let me see if I can do this over again here. So I want to simplify this. And actually, so here. Um, ah, yes, yeah, see why. And so I needed to combine these terms here first. So we got K E Y and a K uh, minus K E C Y. So this is uh, K E minus K E C times Y. And oops. Um, and but we can factor out this the, that as well. K, uh, this is one minus C, K, E, Y, but this actually has to be careful about the order of things, unfortunately. Yes. All right. So now I've got 
a u times something and a y times something is b k e times the vector u one minus c times y. I still think I have an error in here, but it's something like this. The, and the point, but the point is, this is this is a, a b like thing, and this oh, is okay. a, a u like thing. And and so using our LQR, and this is let's um, and this is an a like thing. So the the uh, for a given um, uh, q and r, something that describes what we care about. And by the way, uh, these are describing the the noise in your Ys, and the R is describing how much noise there is in your pushes. Is something else pushing us? And uh, so now you just you you get the the estimator values from the LQR of of these funny values uh, that I'll just write as A B. Q and R again. You're running and, off the screen again. Oops, Here's sorry. Um, and actually, it can be written more succinctly. And it's a, a funny notation. I'd have to look it up. It's actually the LQR of the original A, it, but transpose, and the original B transpose, and uh, and the, the noise things. And so this this estimator value. So now we have. Uh, uh, do I have a written out properly? All right, I'm falling down right at the edge here, making it making this uh, nice and clean for you. But uh, the net net of this is that with this estimator, we we can take uh, the uh, a particular estimate of where we are, multiply it by a, uh, add to it uh, the the pushes. Uh, times the uh, actually I think that, that uh, scales the, the pushes times the pushes which are in this case are the u and the the, uh, the actual pushes on the motor and our measurements and that will give us the next value of the uh, of the estimator exactly the same form as what we used before to iterate uh, the the uh, what's the next uh, control going to be. Um, so the, the punchline of all this, and I, I could spend, uh, sorry? So what's the use of the estimator? Uh, yeah. Because it, to use a full state controller, you have to have uh, a measurement of all the state, all, even though you only have a few different measurements. Then the segue you have the you might have the measurement of the angle of the wheel, and you might have the 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 rate that the stick is falling. But from those two measurements, you want to estimate what are all the uh, what are the other terms so that you have a full state. And now now that you have a full an estimate of the full state, and you apply the regulator values to it, uh, you get nice uh, regulated behavior. And by the way, the uh, the the LQR for the controller is optimal in, in, a, in the sense that you've specified, but this uh, estimator is optimal also. Uh, and in fact, this uh, optimal estimator has a fancy name. This is a Kalman estimator. That's what a Kalman estimator is. Um, and we're running out of time here. Um, and, but the, the important thing I want you to get from this, besides my, I have to, be, I have to be really careful about the algebra to, to, if I were to make this accurate enough for you to go use this particular thing, um, because you, this, you need to check this and you need to get familiar with all the forms and get it set up in Octave correctly to be able to use it. And I, I'll, I'll show you how, what that looks like. But the important thing here is that this Kalman estimator for using the, the idea of LQR to find the best, cons, uh, best gains, and we're using uh, all the information we have. And the information we have is that we, we know what the dynamics of the system is. We know how we're pushing on the system. And we're, we, when we have certain measured values and we're using all those measured values. And, uh, and if you 
use all these things together, that's, that's the best you could possibly do to estimate uh, what the true state of the system is, even though you can't measure everything perfectly. This is the, the optimal estimation of the system. And if the estimator is optimal and the controller is optimal, then the whole system is optimal, which is another important result. Um, speaking of results, um, Oh, could you say again what the full, you said there's the full state, right? Um, yes. So what was the uh, the estimator adding? Like which part of it ah. we already know? We already knew part of the state, but we didn't know the rest of it, right? Yeah, so uh, when you apply your control law, you're gonna have, you're gonna have uh, the, the pushes you know, times your B thing, um, and but your uh, but your your pushes are your uh, regulator values. They're your PD for you know a P and a D and so on, times your estimated uh, state, and that's what you're going to that's what you're going to use to generate uh, you know, each step in your control. This is the, uh, this is exactly uh, what your controls look like. Actually, let me let me uh, jump to a, a real tangible example. Um, I'm just a modest example. Um, and there, there, there are so many more. I have a slide somewhere that, that showed you uh, just a tip of the iceberg of other results. It turns out you know, uh, by just looking at these different matrices, matrices, you can do simple tests to find out uh, if the system is not only stable, but uh, given the measurements you have, uh, can you estimate everything else. And given the pushes that you have, can you control it? So is it controllable and is it observable from just simple algebraic tests on the matrices? Um, in fact, you know, there's one thing, I, the, the other little bookkeeping thing that's amazing, the last bookkeeping thing, where's that one with the mathematical on it? Unbelievable stack of papers for now. I can I can just draw out here. Remember, we, we have a uh, uh, where's that last slide or first slide? That's all right. White piece of paper. Remember, we we started out with x dot equals a x plus b u and y equals cx plus du. And we never got around to talking about du, but we talked about the pushes. We talked about the measurements. We talked about something that describes the relationship between the state and the measurements. The, this is what happens. Um, and that's that's you know, all, well, and this is the time derivative. So that's kind of all the pieces. But uh, uh, one of the last little pieces of, of bookkeeping that's so important that actually makes this really powerful is that we have this A, B, C, D. And an, an example we've used a lot here, uh, A happened to be a four by four and B happened to be a one, one by four and C happened to be a two by four. And that means that D has to be a one by one that these four matrices stack up with their dimensions matching just like this. And so you get this automatic test of, di of the dimensionality of the things you're building so, and to help keep things straight. It's, it's really beautiful. Uh, and we'll see that in a, a real example here. So uh, let's switch cameras. Doesn't D uh, have to be one by two to make that square? Not quite, thank you, thank you. You're right, you're right. Gosh, you guys never miss. Surprised you didn't catch some negative signs too. Um, so let me switch to um, another system. And yeah, let's see, are we watching? Yeah, are we watching this? You may share this screen. Are you seeing my octave still? Nope. Uh, yes, you are. Uh, no, we're seeing your paper pen and pencil. Okay. Paper. So the paper. Uh, so how are we going to show 
Okay, that's that. But I wanted to have. I don't know. I'm just going to switch to my camera. Um, how do I? Shoot. Oh, just this camera. Logitech Rio. All right. <laughs> I'm here. Ah, I still have a little bit of hair left. But uh, uh, here is a. Uh, it's, it's actually not running. He's got another camera, fancy pants. All right, so here's a web interface for a pendulum. And if you can move back, you can see here's a here's a segue uh, kind of pendulum, and this can you see the wheel at the top and roll back and forth, and it can it can wiggle. I think we and can share the screen and show the camera at the same. Say again. I think we can share the screen and show the camera at the same time. So you can see that, can you see the UI now? Yes. Okay, and you can see the, the yeah. pendulum? No. And, and actually, yeah. uh, uh, the, the, the graph at the top, you can see the roll rate and the roll rate hat. So that's the, the real roll rate uh, and from the sensor directly, and but the estimator output. You see they track each other perfectly. The next one down is that, that alpha, the measurement of the uh, of that sensor between the wheel and the stick. Uh, and so now it's at about zero. And you can, and if you, uh, you can see the pendulum by, uh, you move back a little further so you can see the whole thing-ish. You can see what I, you know, this, you know, moves like a pendulum, right? That's, that's what a pendulum does. Um, but, and you're seeing this whole screen here, right? So if I do, So I'm going to bring over my octave. Um, yeah, yeah, make that bigger for me. One second. Then. Okay. So here's the octave. With that, the A is a four by four matrix. Here's the B describing the. The, how the pushes go between the wheel and the, and the pendulum, the, the, the mixing of the sensors, uh, and uh, I run a simulation of a, of a controller. And so now to go back to the, yeah, but that's an amazing thing here. Let me show you. One of the things that this, that the octave does here at the end is it outputs uh, a bunch of the results, but very carefully crafted in uh, in node format. And so, but here, this over here, you see this. So it, it created this uh, file in our node system, and uploaded that to the Raspberry Pi, uh, just with by running a simulation. And so, if I turn on this the controller, uh, and I try to make the pendulum move. So, so here's yep, yep. Yep. so here's here's a normal pendulum. That's what a normal pendulum does, right? And when I turn on the controller that has a particular value, I don't. I want you to go back to zero, but I want to control how much you you wiggle. And I said I don't really don't want it to wag around, and so I said okay, I won't wag around. Or if you turn on the controller while it's swinging. Oh uh, sure. So now it's swinging really big. I'm turning on the controller and it, it stops it and brings it back to zero. And uh, if, if you can still see my octave here, if I change the values uh, for what we care about, so uh, I can change that I don't care. Let's say I care more about the velocity. I really don't want very much velocity. So say it run, it runs a simulation. It uploads the, the new constants to uh, to the code, restarts the UI, and now we get a slightly different behavior. Yeah, are you convinced? Very nice, very nice. And and so now one more thing though is is you, just uh, just quickly is this LMR uh, something controller? 
Uh, yes. Is that the uh, from the Pi display? Is it from? It, it's a JavaScript interface that we've written to talk to the Pi and graph all the data of the internals happening on the Pi. Yeah, the yeah so Pi is running a node node. That's right. And uh, this is displaying that web page. Okay. That's right. It's a web interface. That's just how we uh, how we do things around here. Um, let me show one That's, more thing. Uh, Cameron Tacklin, ladies and gentlemen. My, my business partner, the, the, the computer genius. I couldn't do any of this without him. Okay, so All here's, right. the, here's exactly the same thing, except I've changed this one sign to a minus one. Because it turns out if you derive the A matrix, if it's upside down or, or right side up, the only difference is it changing the sign in two places. And um, so you see that the UI reloaded. Um, and I'll turn this pendulum upside down. Right. You got to get out of the way. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kim, let's see. How about there? Oh, you love this. I, I have to click switch out of a mouse so uh, up to here so I can hold on to this while I click the mouse. And let's, uh, I got to point it to the start button. And then push start. And it's alive. Wow. That's not your regular hobby servo there, though, is it? No, not at all. It's actually just a, a brushless DC motor we've shown off before. Uh, with our own controller, but it turns out that doesn't matter so much. But the whole thing is a state space uh, derivation, LQR, uh, optimal control, uh, Kalman estimator, because uh, we only measure two things. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, you get to choose what, how, uh, how robust you want it to be, you know, what you care about. Uh, these are just some random values for the, uh, uh, for the. That's for awesome, values. Chris. Yep, it's, it's really fun. <laughs> and if, uh, if, if this awesome. were a live, a live meeting, you'd got, you could all play with it and change the numbers and kick it around. Very awesome. Um, what questions? Uh, is the, is, are you running this now as a hanging pendulum or an inverted pendulum? Well, that last demo was, it was uh, inverted. The, yeah, the first demo was a hanging pendulum that is self-stable, but we took exactly the same dynamics and flipped it upside down or right side up, depending on how you want to define it. The, the A matrix is almost the same, just to change a couple of signs. And then boom, it's all, it, it all works. I don't know if anybody else can see it or not, but I can't see the pendulum. All I see is your screen share. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you can. It's in his um, participant window instead of... Yes. Yeah, they're displaying two windows. It's yeah. you see my hand? Yeah. Waving? Yeah. So that's the yeah, pendulum hanging down. And do you want to put it straight up again, Ken? Or you want me to do it? Ready? Huh? No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, I need to play some circus music. That's yeah. what you need. Ready? Yep. On. Yep. Yeah. I, this is hard to do with two hands. Yeah. <laughs> uh, working without a net here. <laughs> <laughs> I love live demos. <laughs> the horror, right? <laughs> Someone needs to implement that reset to zero yeah. button. It should just reset what the measurement is. It's like an RVIS grid on the ceiling. <laughs> it's all a simulation, Mike. As we all are. Yeah. There, you go. So there, it's upside down. there we go. Nice. Well, I got most of this, but what I got particularly valuable for this out of it uh, for me was I'm beginning to understand the instabilities that are in the nav system and uh, giving me some things to look into as to what values I need to be changing to make the nav system more stable. Yes, uh, this is uh, you know, a, a quick introduction to a, a huge field of work. You know, I just, I'm just blown away by uh, the level of sophistication that people have put into this modern control stuff. And, uh, and by the way, this is the way 
everything is done now. I mean, you, you can't really make a Segway controller without exactly this. You know, an ad hoc controller, you know, if you, you change one little thing, you know, how do you scale it? Uh, but with this method, uh, boom, it's all very taken care of. By the way, uh, Russ Ted Drake, the MIT lead uh, at uh, the Robo Games forever ago, and they ran an Atlas uh, at 28 degrees of freedom. That means his A matrix was nearly 50 square, 50 by 50 A matrix. So this estimator was taking a, a 50 uh, column of 50 numbers, multiplying by that 50 matrix to come up with a new estimate. Take that estimate, you multiply it by your gains, your LQR gains to come up with a, a, a these are how you push your 28 different actuators all simultaneously, thousand times a second. That's how Atlas works. Oh my God. <laughs> hey, Chris, I want to thank yes. you for the presentation this evening. It's been awesome. Uh, I think I may have even gained a few IQ points along the way. <laughs> There's another thank one you. Of my presentations I'm going to be watching several times again. Yeah. Really thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chris. I think actually some of it actually sunk in. I'd probably well, have yes, to watch it over. Like, yeah, it's a, for me, this has to sink in sort of osmotically. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and once you start getting, uh, the, you know, the, you know this, uh, this ABCD stuff, when you now when you go look at somebody else talking about it, like I, I read uh, just something, oh, I want to check on that paper. And they started out mm -hmm. by saying, given the system dynamics of A and a, uh, and a, a, regula a regulator mm -hmm. of the uh, values of, from LQR, like, oh, I know what they're talking about now. Yeah. It's so yeah. like, actually, you can understand I mean, what the I, paper's about. I get, the, I get the matrix math from, like, all the work I've done in computer graphics and, and yeah, more great. recently machine machine wow. learning. Yep. Uh, so by the way, uh, a lot uh, of the rest of it kind of escapes me, but it's kind of starting to sink in. So thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Steve Brunton, he has, I don't know how many hundreds of lectures. And one series that I started, I just haven't had time, was applying these ideas to turbulent flow, applying the same ideas to uh, video compression. And so in video compression, for example, you have a big frame. It's a million pixels. The state vector is a million pixels long. And you've got a, a, an A matrix, it's a, a million by a million, that tells you what's the next frame going to be. And so there's a whole body of math about, well, which parts of the A matrix matter? Uh, how do you generate the A matrix on the fly by what's happening so that you can take the state of the image and predict what the next state's going to be? All the same ideas. So just, just phenomenal. And in fact, I think that all of undergraduate differential equations should be taught this way. Any other way is just a waste of time. Yeah. So, yeah. Second vote for the Steve Brunton lectures there. Uh, he is uh, amazingly clear and amazingly prolific. Yes. How many hours of video he has? It was huge. Incredible. Incredible. I'll post a link to you. I took a course called um, from uh, the uh, it's called from the Georgia Institute of Technology called Control of Mobile Robots free on Coursera. I think it, it seemed like you tried to, you covered the entire six week course in one hour, but <laughs> it can go a little slower if you take that class. <laughs> Actually, I would love to, that reference. Can you tell me that again? I posted it, I pasted it in the, uh, the chat a uh, little, I'll paste it again at the bottom. It's, a, it's really good. Um, it's a nice pace. I, I am not familiar with the other one though. I haven't, you know, seen the other ones you mentioned, but. I'm probably going to check those out next. <laughs> yeah, I, it's this online stuff is just fantastic. Uh, but we got to figure out some way to make it all fit together more seamlessly and help us get the right background so we can get it instead of watching lectures and getting 10% of it and not realizing it like I did. All right, so enjoy your evenings. Thank well, you, thank Chris. You. Thank you, Chris. I, 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 thank I, you, Chris. I look forward to being together in person soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. See you later. All right. So uh, that, that concludes the meeting. And um, I think we're in random access now. So we'll hang out in the parking lot until security comes and kicks us out. Thank you very much. Just watch the Security's in the background here. They're not going anywhere.
Thank you very much.